Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 811 for March 22nd, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. I think we have to wrap our heads around the fact that the economic impact of this is going to be uh, unprecedented. And we have never seen anything like this before, not in my lifetime, not in yours. And we have to to understand that there's going to be a price tag at some point. And that price tag is going to be as high as we value our small businesses. Chris Montana laid off his entire tasting room staff at Denord Craft Spirits in Minneapolis this week. And he doesn't know how much longer he'll be able to keep his distillery going. Distillers around the world are doing what they can to help with the coronavirus crisis, with many switching over some of their production to making hand sanitizer. But 9 out of 10 U.S. craft distillers make most of their revenue from sales in their shops and tasting rooms, and many states have closed down bars, restaurants, and other retail businesses that are deemed non-essential. Chris Montana has both the macro and the micro view on this, As the first two-term president of the American Craft Spirits Association, he's also fielding calls from his colleagues around the country with their own questions and concerns. We'll talk with Chris and take a wider look at this story on WhiskeyCast In-Depth. That's coming up along with your voice, the What I'm Tasting This Week department, and on Behind the Label, we're all feeling some stress these days, but just how does stress affect whiskey making? Wash your hands, pour a dram, and settle back for this week's Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey, and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking, winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. As I'm recording this week's episode, Congress is trying to work out a massive economic stimulus package to salvage what is left of the U.S. economy in the wake of coronavirus-related business closings. Chris Swanger of the Distilled Spirits Council is among the industry leaders pushing Congress to make sure that distillers are included in this round of stimulus legislation, along with removing some red tape to let distillers do more to help. Obviously, making the Craft Beverage Modernization Act a permit. In addition to that, the consideration of removing the federal excise tax for a short period uh, that would ingest money back into many of the distilleries around the country. We're working very, very closely with the uh, American Distilled Spirits Association, the American Craft Spirits Association, ADI, the American uh, uh, Distillers Institute, and all of the above. In addition, uh, which is a great story to tell, as many of our distilleries are transitioning uh, uh, some of their production to hand sanitizer, uh, we're working with Congress and TTB and the Department of Treasury uh, with, a, with the possibility of removing the FDT uh, for some of the alcohol products uh, because uh, that would enable many of our distillers to bring bring hand sanitizer products to the community. This is a team effort, and uh, the nation's distillers are rising to the occasion. Give me a sense of the tax implications involved, because uh, we know that, for instance, the denatured alcohol that's used in hand sanitizer is taxed at a much lower rate than beverage alcohol, even at the uh, craft distiller's rate. Correct. And, you know, some of our uh, distilleries are equipped to do that, and some are not. So we've had a series of discussions with Capitol Hill and with TTB. They are unable to address the FDT issue. Uh, So uh, we are quickly working with uh, members of Congress. We had a call yesterday with uh, the Senate Majority Leader's Office. 
uh, where, where resides, obviously, from Kentucky. And, uh, you know, as, as Congress is moving quickly on an uh, economic stimulus package, we're hoping we can get that issue resolved quickly. We'll keep you updated on the progress of both the stimulus package and the tax implications for producing hand sanitizer during the week at WhiskeyCast.com. Of course, the U.S. isn't the only country facing the coronavirus pandemic or the only one looking at ways to help people put out of work. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson ordered the nation's pubs and restaurants closed this weekend, along with other retail businesses. His government is giving them a tax holiday on business taxes for the next year, and the government also pledged this week to give businesses grants to pay their workers 80% of their lost wages, up to 2,500 pounds a month each, for at least the next three months, as long as those workers stay on the company payroll. Denmark is offering a similar program covering 75% of wages, while France is offering laid-off workers benefits covering about 85% of their former job's pay. Let's get back to the hand sanitizer story for just a minute now. We've been hearing all week long from distilleries around the world that are now using their stills to make alcohol for use in hand sanitizers and as a disinfectant. The list includes both big and small distillers, from Pernod Ricard's Irish Distillers team at Middleton and the Hiram Walker Distillery in Canada, to local craft distillers like Catoctin Creek and many more around the U.S. But I want to focus for a minute on a small distillery that's facing a unique situation. Ka'olau Distillery in Kailua, Hawaii started making hand sanitizer this week. The distillery is run by two retired U.S. Marine Corps officers, Eric Dill and Ian Brooks. The hand sanitizer shortage is even more critical in Hawaii right now. Since it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Eric Dill says everything has to be shipped to Hawaii from the U.S. mainland, either by ship or by air freight. Everything that's not made here, and that's that's the key, is that you know we are able to to, to make portions of the ingredients for hand sanitizer here and and specifically i can make the alcohol the ethyl alcohol portion uh of of the ingredients i, I am I, I do have a need in the, in the sense that i'm limited to the number of bottles uh that i have uh i've got them on order and i'm waiting for them to show up on a either a plane or a ship we were fortunate a local company that produces uh suntan lotion they had quite a few uh bottles they gave us several hundred little uh, pump spray bottles uh, last night, and we filled those. We can fill some more today. And, and then we're hoping for the uh, the rest, the stuff that I've ordered to start showing up here on the 24th is what's anticipated right now. Because we have limited, we made a decision that it would be first responders, uh, hospital health care workers, and then the uh, civil service people that uh, literally keep the lights on and the water flowing. We've both seen the chaos when those basic services go away in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we thought, you know, let's, let's limit it to that. That's what we can do right now. We've had so many calls from like doctor's offices and things like that, but uh, we actually feel those, those three categories that I listed are more important. We also heard this weekend from the Dry Diggings Distillery in Northern California, just outside of Sacramento. They pointed out that it costs a distillery about $1.50 in raw materials to produce a 4-ounce bottle of hand sanitizer, and a lot of smaller family-owned distilleries are dipping into their cash reserves to buy the raw materials to make sanitizers that they're then donating to hospitals and first responders. Dry Diggings has set up a GoFundMe campaign to collect donations to cover those costs, and we have posted a link in our show notes. Now, some distilleries are giving their sanitizers or disinfecting alcohol away to the public for free. We know that Catoctin Creek in Virginia has been doing that as long as you bring your own bottle. But if you do go to a distillery and get some free sanitizer, it might be nice to ask if you can make a small donation to help cover their costs. While many distilleries have now suspended tours and many have also closed their gift shops, Kentucky's Four Roses Distillery has taken a more drastic step. As far as we know, it's one of the first distilleries to shut down production altogether to help prevent the spread of the coronavirus. 
That shutdown started Friday and will last until at least April 6th. It's no secret that the coronavirus pandemic has created economic chaos for millions of people around the world, but one of the hardest-hit groups is those people who work in the hospitality industry. As more governments close down bars and restaurants to try and flatten the curve of the coronavirus spread, many bartenders, barbacks, servers, cooks, and other hourly workers are being laid off. Many of the large spirits companies have stepped up already, including Diageo, Pernod Ricard, and Beam Suntory. They're all making large donations to groups that help support bar workers in many countries. This week alone, the U.S. Bartenders Guild Foundation's Emergency Assistance Program received $1.8 million in donations from the industry. Kim Hasserud is one of the foundation's directors, and I spent a few minutes on the phone with her Friday night to get some perspective. They know $1.8 million sounds like a lot of money, but when you're, when you're trying to service the entire bar industry across the United States that are without a job, it's not that much. And so we're, we're, we're imploring people, you know, businesses, even businesses that aren't necessarily directly related to, to bartenders and, and working behind the bar to, to make donations. Underneath this fund, we've been able to give grants to bartenders that experience some kind of catastrophic life event. So, for example, uh, a fire where they've lost their home or most one of the most recent tragedies in Nashville where the tornado completely decimated a lot of homes and restaurants and bars. We were able to give grants for that. Uh, they're usually kind of tied to, to a specific catastrophic life event. You know, this is the COVID-19 relief efforts. Um, you know, we're hoping to give grants to, to bartenders. The grant is meant to be like, a cushion to give a little bit of breathing room while bartenders figure out their next step. So, you know, uh, some money to go get groceries or gas or help offset their bills or rent. So it's meant to be, to be that place. Um, and those grant, these grants are going to range anywhere from like 150 to $500 depending on their need and assessment. Um, so that's where we're at <laughs> right now. And, you know, we've literally, this week has just been an explosion, both of donations and applicants. That's just been unprecedented. Um, it's an it's an amazing the amount of support that we've gotten, um, but we need to kind of continue to to keep that funding coming in, just so we're able to to service you know the entire bar, uh, bar industry. One thing to note too is all applicants um, they do not necessarily they do not need to be a USDG member to apply. We're a five hundred one c three, so we are open to any and all bartenders and uh, bar service people who serve who who serve alcohol. Give me an idea of the requests for help or the amount of requests for help without giving any specific individuals of what you've seen already since uh, mm-hmm. bars and restaurants started shutting down a few days ago. The number of applicants has been like in the tens of thousands. <laughs> and, you know, um, we are in the process and we almost have it dialed in. And, and this literally just happened this week where we've gotten this huge influx of, of applicants. And while we've had the mechanisms uh, in place, we are having to scale up our technology and add in additional steps and processes with uh, a bigger workforce of people. So we plan to start actually starting to screen those applications on Monday. Um, So as far as I wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you like trends that I'm seeing yet. um, But I do know that, you know, just from the the chatter I've seen on social media is that the need has really varied greatly from, you know, those that are uh, the restaurant just closed this week and they're, you know, they, they may need help offsetting rent to people that have actually have had family that's infected. So it really has kind of run the gamut between um, the need based. But, you know, I mean, you know, one thing I want to point out to you and, and really reach out to, to people who don't necessarily work in this industry of how serious this is, um, you know, bartenders don't, a lot of them don't have insurance and a lot of them don't have a big safety net. Um, and, it's not like if your restaurant closes, oh, I'll just go apply at the restaurant down the street, you know, or the bar down the street because they don't, all, all of those restaurants are on lockdown. 
so there, you know, there's there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress with hospitality workers in general. Like, what is my next move going to be? Do I need to change industries? Now I need to kind of be creative and what are some of my other skills that I have and assets that I can put to use during this time while I can't work? Because they can't do the same. They can't work at another bar or restaurant, at least for the time being. So, um, yeah, I would say it's, it's pretty... Um, it's pretty uh, stressful time for a lot of people, but you know, the, the one great advantage about an organization is that because we have chapters, you know, across the U S and each of those chapters are really trying to, to pull together some great resources uh, locally that people can tap into. So various grants um, funds, different organizations that are, you know, doing things with uh, putting meals together and things like that. So I think there's, there's, a lot of resources at people's fingertips and we're in the midst of putting all of that together as well. What can individuals do if they want to help? I mean, a lot of us, none of us can afford to do a million dollars like Beam Centauri did, but Mm -hmm. if somebody wants to take, say, what they would have spent at the bar this week and donate it, what can they do? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, anyone can donate any amount. If they go to usbgfoundation.org, there's a link that takes you to um, a donation link. And you can, you know, donate as little as $25. If you want to do something in, you know, your, your local community, we recommend um, buying, you know, gift cards for your favorite restaurants and bars as a way to support them. A lot of them go, are going to curbside now. So that could be a great way. And there, there are also, also some local things being put together, like a, your local tip jar. So I would say if you want to support locally, you know, look to some of those local USBG chapters that are pulling together some of those resources and programs um, and, do, and do some research. You know, there's a, just by way of example here in Phoenix, there's another organization called Culinary Love that's giving to uh, collecting resources for both front of house and back of house workers. So there's resources and programs that are being implemented um, on a local regional level too that people can tap into. We've posted a link to the Foundation's website in our show notes for this episode at WhiskeyCast.com. For groups in other countries doing similar work, please let us know what you're doing, and we'll add your links to the list. And later on, I'll tell you what we're doing to help in this effort as well. The news has come so fast this week that it almost seems like the cancellations of three major spring whiskey festivals in Scotland are now old news. As we reported this week at WhiskeyCast.com, the Spirit of Speyside Festival, the Isla Festival of Malt and Music, Bay Sheel, and the Campbellton Malts Festival have all canceled their events for this year and will start working on their 2021 plans. All three cited Scottish government guidelines against holding large-scale events. Their decisions came as the UK government started a nationwide clampdown on public gatherings. Isla Festival directors have declined interview requests, but I spoke with Spirit of Speyside Festival Chairman James Campbell shortly after the announcement. To be fair to our distillers, uh, our event providers, we've tried to wait as long as possible before making a decision. And we've always been hopeful that somewhere along the line, the news on the coronavirus would maybe turn for the better and we would be able to have our Fantastic festival uh, once again, but the news just keeps getting worse and worse. And with the latest restrictions, uh, very severe restrictions announced last night, that really just puts an end to the options that we have in front of us. And there was no option for rescheduling, obviously. I know you've got two other festivals later this year, but uh, there was no way to reschedule. Well, we, we have. I mean, we have uh, 700 events, Mark, and I mean, it takes a massive amount of planning ahead. Uh, our distillers, our event providers do a huge amount of work to create new events every year. But what we don't know is when are we going to be clear? You know, if we, if we knew we had a three-month window to try and make a run at this, then it might be possible to do something in the autumn. But uh, all of the guidance looks like it's going ahead for several weeks and maybe several months ahead. Um, so, and then, as you say, we then have other dates in the autumn that we've got to um, we've got to, to to schedule too, and let's hope that they will be uh, possible. But um, it just physically was not possible. It's a real, very, very sad. We've been going for twenty years. 
this was going to be our 21st year, our biggest festival. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were looking so much uh, forward to meeting all of the great people who come from all over the world to Speyside uh, for our festival and lots of old friends and uh, uh, great whiskey lovers. And it's, it's a fantastic. Well, you know, Mark, you've been here. You know, it's a fantastic uh, place to be. And uh, we are certainly going to miss it this year very much. What kind of an economic impact do you expect this to have on the uh, Speyside region? I know it's not the major economic driver, but uh, the whole festival was created as a way to bring tourists in a little earlier than usual in the past. Well, that's correct, Mark, yes. I mean, uh, the festival probably adds more than £2 million pounds to the local economy over the space of uh, six days. Uh, and obviously, that number is going to disappear, but... Uh, you know, the, the, the larger picture, uh, you know, across the whole world, we can see that people are not traveling. Uh, in Scotland, uh, tourism is such a, a, a massive uh, contributor to the local economy, certainly the, the, the rural economies uh, and the rural areas. So uh, this uh, whole coronavirus thing, stopping guests from coming all over the world, I think we had 2 million visitors to Speyside Distilleries not Speyside, but to Scottish distilleries last year. And um, we very much hope that once the travel restrictions are eased, that uh, more and more people will start to feel, and and obviously we don't want people to come if there is any risk. There are are very few uh, cases in Scotland at the moment, but obviously the picture is changing rapidly as it is elsewhere in the world. Give me a sense of what the mood was like in the room tonight when you uh, made the decision. Uh, I, I think we're all, um, you know, enthusiasts. We're all, we all love the whiskey festival. We love meeting up with all our friends from all over the world. And, you know, it is such a, a, a happy occasion. Uh, lots of, um, uh, you know, lots of fun. Uh, it's all about whiskey, music, food and fun, as you know. And, uh, you know, we, we were very sad. And, and if there had been any other alternatives, I, I don't, you know, our number one priority is to make sure that our visiting guests and the people of Speyside and local communities and all of our distillers and event providers are safe. And we do not want to put them into any unnecessary risk. And really that factor has, you know, obviously overrid all of the other concerns. But we were all very, very sad. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not something we've done lightly. And as I said earlier, we have actually tried to delay this decision following government advice just absolutely to the letter all of the way um, to see if there was a, a more positive, you know, hopefully that, that one of the countries who have been affected shows some great uh, recovery or there's some potential uh, cure or vaccination that might have uh, changed the picture going forward. But, you know, that's no longer possible. And to be fair to all of our, our, our customers and our, our visiting guests, we really need to give them as much warning as we've now given them to uh, rearrange their plans. Uh, some of them, you know, obviously will have to cancel flights and get their refunds and, 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 and get all of that organized. And we think that, uh, you know, we've probably delayed it as far as we possibly can. As far as refunds for the thousands of tickets already sold for festival events, Campbell says it'll be up to the event organizers to offer refunds but that he expects most of the distilleries will do so. We'll make the entire interview available in the news section at whiskeycast.com. There was other news in the whiskey world this week, including an update on a story we brought you three weeks ago. Secret Spirits founders Jonathan and Cindy Bray were released from an Idaho jail on Friday following a court hearing in Coeur d'Alene. They were arrested last month by Idaho State Police on charges of illegally selling whiskey from their storage unit to undercover state liquor agents. After their arrests, a judge ordered both Brays to turn over their Canadian passports. It's not known whether they will be allowed to return home to Calgary until their trial, which is currently scheduled to begin July 20th. Their lawyer has not returned our requests for comments on the case. One of America's top whiskey bars put its entire collection on the curb Friday, literally. The Jack Rose Dining Saloon in Washington, D.C. put all of its 2,700 bottles up for sale. Buy the dram in sample size bottles, 
and selling off entire unopened full bottles. Jack Rowe's owner, Bill Thomas, told local news outlets he decided to sell off what he called, quote, a shit ton of whiskey to make sure he could keep paying his staff and be debt-free when things recover once the coronavirus crisis ends. Bill was too busy selling off bottles to return our requests for an interview. We do have some news on the auction front as well. Yes, whiskey auctions have been taking place despite the pandemic, but that's likely to go entirely online in the very near future, depending on how long governments continue to ban large gatherings. Sotheby's held its latest wine and spirits auction Wednesday in London. Half of the winning bids were placed online. A complete vertical series of the Macallan in Lalique Six Pillars collection brought a high bid of 423,500 pounds, around $498,000 at current exchange rates. A 1960 Kuruazawa 52-year-old single cask, said to be the oldest Kuruazawa ever released, set what Sotheby's is claiming as a world record price for a bottle of Japanese whiskey. The high bid was 363,000 pounds, about $427,000. Last month, we reported on the Irish distiller's release of 48 bottles of 45-year-old peated Irish single malt from the old Middleton distillery, which closed back in 1975 when the current Middleton distillery opened. The very first bottle from that batch went on the block at irishwhiskeyauctions.com. The auction ended Sunday with a winning bid of 42,000 euros. That's around $45,000. And that would make it the highest price ever paid for a bottle of Irish whiskey. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Larceny Bourbon's heritage goes back to the days when Treasury agent John E. Fitzgerald was patrolling the rickhouses of Kentucky, not just for the feds, but also for himself. Seems he was stealing a taste out of some of his favorite barrels of weeded bourbon on the side. Today's award-winning Larceny Bourbon has that same soft, smooth character Fitzgerald loved. Look for 92-proof Larceny Bourbon at your local retailer and be on the lookout for the first limited edition release of Larceny Barrel Proof. You can always find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. A few quick notes now. We released a special episode of Whiskey Cast the other day featuring a panel discussion on the past and future of whiskey from this month's Dramfest 2020 in Christchurch, New Zealand. I was on the panel along with Charles McLean and Michael Fraser Milne of Whiskey Galore in Christchurch. Dave Broom was our moderator. It's just part of the extra content we are working on right now to help you deal with being stuck at home or wherever you're self-isolating during the pandemic. This week we plan to start hosting some real-time online video chats using Zoom, And we're trying to find out which distillers and other whiskey makers are available to join us for an hour or so. Keep an eye on our social media timelines for updates this week. Now, we heard from Kim Hasserud of the U.S. Bartenders Guild a few minutes ago on the crisis that many bartenders and other drinks industry workers are personally facing because of mandatory closings in many countries. I made this offer this weekend on our social media feeds, and I'll repeat it now. If you donate at least $25 to the USBG Foundation's Bartender Emergency Assistance Program, or a similar fund if you're outside of the U.S., just email us a copy of the receipt with your credit card number blacked out, of course, and I will record a personalized voicemail message for your phone. Now, if you happen to own a business and you donate $250, I'll record the voicemail greeting for your business. Just send the receipts and your contact info to comments at whiskeycast.com, and we'll work out the details by email. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distillery. And first off, I need to correct an error from last week's episode. Tickets for the Spirit of Toronto Festival are going on sale April 7th, not April 1st, as I said last week. 
The festival is still scheduled as of now for April 25th, but as with any event scheduled between now and, realistically, the end of June, it is subject to change. We are starting to see some events that had already been postponed being rescheduled, but once again, you're going to want to check each event's website on a regular basis for updates. Whiskey Live in Tel Aviv, Israel has been rescheduled for May 13th and 14th. The Whiskey Classic in Morristown, New Jersey is tentatively set now for May 14th. The Whiskey Obsession Festival in Tampa, Florida is now set for June 4th. And Whiskey and Barrel Night in New York City is now scheduled for June 11th. Buffalo Trace has rescheduled its final Legendary Craftsman Dinner Series evening until August 7th. And with Churchill Downs now planning to hold the Kentucky Derby in September, the Kentucky Derby Museum in Louisville has moved its annual Biscuits and Bourbon event to September 2nd. We have updated the event listings at WhiskeyCast.com. We're updating the event listings at WhiskeyCast.com with details on cancellations, postponements, and rescheduling as we get those details from event organizers. If you have an event that's been affected by the pandemic and need to get the word out, just use the contact form at WhiskeyCast.com to get in touch with us. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, the makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits, including the Roundstone Rye and Rabble Rouser Bottled in Bond Rye. They do it all with renewable solar energy. In fact, you can actually check in and see how their solar array is doing in real time at their website. It's CatoctinCreekDistilling.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. The boom in small scale or craft distilleries worldwide faces a threat from outside the industry's control in the coronavirus pandemic. And given the massive economic impact already, it could be the deciding factor in whether many small distilleries stay in business. We had already started to see what could have been the beginnings of a shakeout in the industry in recent months as a handful of small distilleries closed down. And with many states now ordering mandatory closures of bars and restaurants to all but takeout or delivery service, American Distilling Institute founder Bill Owens sees more distilleries being forced to close for good. I think it could, hurt, it could put 20% of them out of business. But you got to remember, an awful lot of my 2,000 members, probably a third of them are farm distillers. So that means they're still in business. Uh, they, they're just not making any money out of the distillery. Uh, an awful lot of them are uh, well-funded, so it's not going to hurt them. So the people that it's going to hurt are the people who are trying to grow out of earnings that didn't come into the industry well-funded. And you have to remember on my website, I have a statement, if you can get open in less than two years, call me, I'll take you out to lunch. So not many people can take that kind of money loss for two years, and most of them that will survive still have the day job. We talked earlier about attempts on the federal level to include distillers in the economic stimulus package, but there are also moves being made at the state level. Chris Tatum is the president of the Tennessee Distillers Guild, and one of the partners in the Old Forge Distilling Company in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. His distillery draws a million visitors a year because of its proximity to Dollywood and the Gatlinburg area, and while Old Forge did have some spring break tourist traffic over the last week or two, it's already starting to drop off. People are leaving. Uh, we've had some quite a bit of cancellations. Um, 
our distillery, you know, we put measures in place, you know, for the, the spacing and, uh, you know, we're, we're producing hand sanitizer, you know, uh, everybody gets that upon entry. And so we're doing all the things that CDC saying, you know, we're trying to limit group size, you know, um, so all that does is, you know, that just, that definitely puts a strain on revenue and, and there's a big multiplier because, you know, we're not just rely, we don't rely only on people walking in our door here. We rely on people going to restaurants and eating and ordering drinks and stuff. And, and that's the, gosh, man, that's the, that's the big thing too, is that, you know, our, our guild, our association, our industry is, is we definitely are very diverse in all of our different business plans. And this is just something that's, you know, like everybody, it's, uh, it's, it's hitting everybody, you know. What kind of government help do you use uh, the Tennessee Distillers Guild need? What are you guys looking for? You know, I think it's, uh, and, and, well, I, I listed it, you know, in my letter to the governor and then also on our, our PR, you know, there's things, and, and I understand that payroll taxes are something that has to be done from a Fed perspective. I get it. But our voice to the Feds are our local leaders, you know. Um, and then, we, you know, we pay taxes, you know, uh, so from a federal and a state level, we have gallonage taxes based off our alcohol. We have LBD taxes. Uh, sales use tax, um, and then even, you know, you know, our Fed excise tax. So those are all taxes that, you know, people don't realize, you know, a lot of that, those are come and do every two weeks for us, you know? So I love that both local and, and state and federal are looking at helping, you know, very clearly. I think the, the comment, the, the quote was, you know, oh, we're going to help the airlines. It's not their fault. Well, it's none of our faults, you know? And our industry specifically, especially the growth we've experienced over the last, six, seven to 10 years, we're creating and, and we're the bond for these communities, just like in Kentucky, you know, you got an MB rolling up there, you know, I mean, they're part of a community. They're, they're, they're part of the revitalization of either urban areas or rural areas. And, and we shouldn't be forgotten either. You know, I'll tell you this. I know the vast majority, I would say high, high, high percentages of our, of our members in the state of Tennessee, you know, we didn't get big, big grants or big pilot programs or something like that. You know, we went and, Save their money and invested or borrowed or, or what have you to, to create these businesses that create a lot of jobs, pay a lot of taxes, and bring a lot of revenue in for the state. So far, Tennessee officials have not ordered statewide closings of bars or distillery tasting rooms, though there has been a local ban in the city of Nashville. That is not the case in Minnesota, where Governor Tim Walz ordered a statewide shutdown of bars and restaurants last Tuesday to try and limit the spread of the coronavirus. Chris Montana and his wife Chanel opened Dunord Craft Spirits back in 2013, and Chris has become a leader in the craft distilling movement. Last year, he became the first American Craft Spirits Association president to be re-elected for a second term in office. And while he's coming to grips with the fact that his tasting room is now closed and his staff laid off, he's also getting calls from his colleagues around the country who need help with similar problems. I caught up with Chris on Thursday while he was taking care of his kids at home. It's amazing what a couple of weeks will do, right? Um, you know, we are like just about every other small business in the country here are facing some pretty uncertain times. Uh, we made the decision Sunday to close down the customer facing side of our business. That's our tasting room. Uh, it's also any events that we would do outside of our distillery. And we made that move because our staff didn't feel safe. We have staff with compromised immune systems and it just wasn't a position I was willing to put anybody in to ask them to come to work and continue to engage with the public. Uh, considering the coronavirus outbreak. Um, the effect of that on us is it's hard to, to overstate. Um, we are like most micro distilleries in the country. It's the majority and for us, the overwhelming majority of our income comes from on-site sales, cocktail sales, uh, and all of that just evaporated in one day. Happened to be that we did it voluntarily, but we would have had to do it anyway because I think a day later, uh, the governor declared that all such businesses had to close anyway. So now uh, all of our, our friends in Minnesota are in the same boat with us. And I know across the country, there are a lot of other distilleries who are fighting the same fight. Or how much of your business came from the tasting room? 
Well, for us, it kind of varies uh, depending on the season. Um, in the early part of the season, it is very high, closer to 70%. You know, mid, mid-year, mid less than that um, once it gets warm out. Um, but we were, you know, the, the compounding factor for us is that we were in the middle of an expansion. And for months, we've been building out. Uh, we've never had food in our cocktail room. We were building out the restaurant side uh, with a with a food partner. And uh, that was supposed to all open up in a month. And now all that's on hold. And so we were spending more money and thinking that, you know, eventually we would make more. So uh, it's you know, particularly bad timing for us. You're still making spirits, though, right? We are. And I think that that's true of most facilities. Um, the production side is continuing on. Uh, while the customer facing side, if they have shut it down, um, they're, they've shut that side down only and are still producing. Um, many of us are you know, looking at what we should be producing and that, that, uh, is changing. Um, I think there's probably at some point going to be a, a little bit of a hiccup. Um, we're probably maybe two or three years away from a, a hiccup in whiskey availability. Because a lot of folks are looking at how they can support their communities, produce hand sanitizer, things like that. Uh, and I've been working on that extensively with ACSA. Uh, and also you know, just with our own distillery, we we're going to move forward with it anyway. So still producing, although what we're producing seems to be changing. As head of ACSA, what are you hearing from your colleagues around the country? Uh, people are scared. Um, there's some frustration with, getting information and figuring out what we can and cannot do. We have very little uniformity in this country when it comes to the regulations that distilleries have to live under. Um, And so there are 50 different bundles of laws that need to be unpacked to figure out what anyone can do. Um, So not everyone, you know, some people have been asked by their local, um, hospitals or police departments, Department of Safety to produce hand sanitizer for them. And others have been told they can't do it. It's against the law. I mean, it's, it's that side of it's all over the place. But, you know, I, I, in my, uh, in my letter, when I announced, I had mentioned, uh, announced our closing, I had mentioned that 92% of distilleries rely on that walk-in business. And part of the reason why we know that is because 92% of distilleries in the United States make fewer than 592 cases a year. And the only way you can make any kind of money off of that is if you're selling at retail, and so cocktails or bottle sales. Um, so for most of your micro distilleries across the country, in a blink of an eye, uh, that business just went away. And what comes next if there isn't some sort of support for those businesses, we're going to lose a significant majority of our distillery. And that support has to be more than just uh, making the federal excise tax cut permanent, I would assume. Absolutely. I mean, that will help. But, you know, excise tax is a rolling thing, and many of us are paying it quarterly. If you're not selling any booze, and you're not paying any excise tax. So as far as the next excise tax bill, I suppose that would help. And going forward, we obviously want the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act to become permanent. But in the short term, uh, we're talking about the same kind of supports that just about every kind of small business is going to need. You've got employees, we've got a lot of hard costs, and this is a growth industry. And and what I mean by that is not that everybody's printing money, but most people aren't. Most people are still in the phase of their business where – they're losing money. In fact, most micro distilleries in this country are losing money, but they're growing towards a place where we all hope that we will make a dollar one of these days. So to get this kind of an interruption in that process is particularly tough because a lot of the programs that are designed to replace lost revenue um, are, are built off of models that don't necessarily apply to people who make alcohol for a living, particularly for people who make whiskey for a living, who might be laying down a lot of barrels, but not selling a lot right now. And so they don't have much income to replace. So the government supports need to be tailored to our industry. And that's one of the jobs that we have been working on. We got on as soon as this started um, working in DC 
to communicate that fact that yes, we are small businesses. Yes, some of the uh, programs that you have, disaster loan assistance, et cetera, will help us, but that we are a unique industry and we are going to need a unique package uh, to bail out. I don't want to say bail out, but to, to provide stimulus to our businesses that will actually be relevant to their needs. And you're at the end of a very long line of industries that are looking for similar and industry-specific help. Sure. I mean, everyone's at the door. Everyone's knocking, uh, which we should expect. And I think we have to wrap our heads around the fact that the economic impact of this is going to be uh, unprecedented. And we have never seen anything like this before, not in my lifetime, not in yours. And we have to, to understand that there's going to be a price tag at some point. And that price tag is going to be as high as we value our small businesses. I think the largest businesses are going to make it through this. But if we value our small businesses, then we're going to have to do something to bring that side of the economy back. And I really don't think that it's, it's an option uh, to, to let the small businesses of America fail. And here I know I'm speaking more broadly than the distillery sense, but this is broader than the distilleries. It's going to be a significant package. And it's going to have to be. And, you know, but the cost of not doing it is not just the employees that, that I've had to lay off. As of today, I actually had to lay off my entire bar staff. Um, but it's millions of workers across the country. So, yes, there are a lot of people who are going to be there uh, at, at the doors uh, knocking with their hands out. Um, but for us, one, I think we have a particular role to play because we are producers of high strength alcohol and that is something that is in need right now as a sanitizer so we can play a role in this whole thing um, and I think that our industry provides and every industry can say this but I think that our industry uh, provides an awful lot to the culture and development of a lot of areas um, that were failing a lot of our businesses have it abandoned warehouses. Ours was an old ice cream factory and motorcycle shop that was abandoned for more than a decade. And now you've got, you know, economic activity pumping out of there. Many people with jobs, there's probably 40 different people on that site now that all have jobs and, and, you know, we have different businesses going because a distillery was placed there in the first place. So I think that it's worth saving. um, And I hope that our legislators see it that way. And speaking more broadly, it's not just distilleries in America. This is craft distilleries and small-scale distillers all over the world because you've got guys who are shutting down in Ireland, the U.K., Canada. This is really repeating itself all over the world. It is. Um, And, I, you know, you like to think think ahead a little bit because we know there's going to be a day after. Um, And the day after problem is uh, things are going to get a little scarce and your favorite bottle of whiskey might be a little hard to find uh, uh, because there's going to be a hiccup in production eventually. Um, But you're right. Uh, Everyone is feeling this, uh, certainly in Europe. Europe is in many ways much worse than we do, but uh, as it looks, we're on our air. So, yeah, it's it's industry-wide. It's really society-wide and worldwide and we're just one small slice of it but that's that's a little solace um i'll tell you i wrote a uh, an email last night it was the hardest email i've ever written and it was an email to my staff informing them that the best thing that we could do for them was to lay them off get unemployment benefits because that'll pay more than i can pay them um i've never laid off an employee in my life and i you know many of our distilleries, and I assume this is true of our friends across the pond, um, these are all passion projects for us. I mean, few of us got into this because we thought we were going to make all the money in the world, and anyone who did get into it thinking they were going to make a whole bunch of money has been abused of that notion, as I assume by now. We got into it because we care about it, and the people that we bring in on that passion project are passionate for. Um, I love each and every one of my employees, and you know, so it's it's not it's not like we're making widgets here. Um, we've got real people with real stories, and I have had to send them home, and that's tough. You know, I I know that sometimes the the business side of things is 
say, oh yeah, well business, well that's not as important. And you know, businesses aren't people and they don't have feelings, but the people who run them and the people who work there do. And this is a, this is a tough time for all of us. I'm really sorry I bothered you today because I, I really feel bad because I didn't know that you'd laid the staff off last night and this morning. I feel, I feel terrible about asking you to talk about this today. You know, it's, I'll tell you, yesterday was hard. Yesterday was hard. Um, and I mean, hell, even talking about it today is hard, but that, that's not a reason to not talk about it. I mean, this is, this is the reality, right? And what I, what I, I want us all to, you know, what I, what I hope and what we've, you know, the message that we've tried to put out in our little community in, in South Minneapolis, uh, you know, the businesses, I guess there, you know, sometimes you talk about business and, and you get painted with this broad brush, like, oh, it's just big business and they're the bad guys. And this idea that if you own a business and you must be printing money and, and all this other stuff. And, you know, we, as a small business owner and other business owners know that's absolutely not true. And that it, we, we aren't callous. We aren't indifferent. We, you know, people matter. And, um, you know, we care very deeply for the people involved in our businesses and, um, I want people to know that it that it matters, and that the the hardest this part of the decision for me wasn't about Denord's bottom line. Uh, if Denord gets swallowed in this, that will be an unfortunate casualty of a global issue. And you know, I will find something else to do with my time. Um, I'll drink for free for the rest of my life because I've got thousands of gallons of booze, but. Um, that it'll be unfortunate, but everyone's going to get by. It has much more to do with the people involved in it. Um, and I've got, I laid off a bartender who's been with me since the day I opened my cocktail room. Our cocktail room opened two years after we started the distillery because it wasn't legal until then. At no point has he not worked <laughs> for the Zunor cocktail room. Um, and we just had to let him go. And we hope to bring him back. But I don't know what's going to be left of the Nord when this whole thing gets done. And so I don't know if I let him go for good. I don't know if that's the last time that, you know, he's going to welcome people into our, into our place. I mean, that's, I don't know. I, I really don't even have words to describe it. It's tough. And I, I know that there are others who are going through the same thing and I feel for them. And I know there are people who are home right now and, and, who are wondering how in the heck they're going to pay for their bills. And I feel for them. I'm wondering the same thing. Um, I hope that we use this as an opportunity to pull a little closer together and come out the other end a little better, a little stronger. That's Chris Montana of Dunord Craft Spirits in Minneapolis. He's also the first two-term president of the American Craft Spirits Association. And like many of us right now, he's facing an uncertain future. We're all in this together, gang. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with the newest single malt from Glenmorangie. The Cadball Estate comes from barley grown on, you guessed it, the Cadball Estate near the distillery. It's bottled at 43% ABV. The nose has a slight nuttiness, along with touches of shortbread cookies, lemon zest, orange peel, and hints of dried flowers. The taste is sweet and luscious with honey, chocolate, tree fruits, and a hint of cough lozenges. The finish is long, sweet, and fruity with just a hint of oak. I'm scoring Glen Morangie's The Cadball Estate a 92. Alistair Walker is the son of longtime Scotch whiskey blender Billy Walker, and after working with Billy and his partners on taking Glenallachie Distillery off on its own, Alistair went off on his own to become an independent bottler. His Alistair Walker Whiskey Company is bottling its single casks under the Infrequent Flyers label. One of the early releases 
is a 20-year-old single malt from an undisclosed Orkney distillery. Take your pick. There's only two of them. This one was distilled in June of 1999, bottled last year at 52.1% ABV. The nose is dry and light with hints of brine and smoked salmon, along with campfire wood and a subtle hint of brown sugar in the background. The taste is peppery with just a hint of smoke, along with grilled citrus fruits and a touch of oak. The finish is very long with touches of anise, licorice, and a citrusy tartness. I'm scoring the Infrequent Flyers 20-year-old Highland Single Malt a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye whiskey was distilled by America's original risk-takers and history-makers. Those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion. Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring-fed Maryland-style rye whiskey. It celebrates the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. Visit sagamorespirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. Springbank is about to come out with the second batch of its local barley 2009 single malt. Batch number one was bottled at 56.2% ABV. The nose is soft and gentle with a nice maltiness along with lemon zest and a hint of brine. The taste is tart, briny, and spicy with a hint of peat smoke and touches of lemon zest, grilled pineapple, brine, and a hint of dried flowers. The finish, long and tart, with just a kiss of smoke. I'm scoring the Springbank Local Barley 2009, batch number 1, a 93. Finally, Jameson released a travel retail exclusive a while back. Triple Triple gets its name from the Triple Distillation, along with maturation in ex-bourbon, sherry, and Malaga wine casks. It's bottled at 40% ABV, I grabbed a bottle on the way home from New Zealand earlier this month. The taste is fruity and sweet with hints of lemon, red apples, nutmeg, and vanilla. The taste is creamy and smooth with a nice citrusy tartness and touches of ginger, apples, and shortbread cookies. The finish, long and tart with just a hint of ginger. I'm scoring the Jameson Triple Triple a 90. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,800 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. A special reminder now from our friends at Redbreast. If you've ever wanted to visit Ireland, well, the folks at Redbreast want to make that happen for you. There is still time left to register for their five-day, four-night trip for two to visit Ireland. All you have to do is visit redbreastwhiskey.com slash Ireland and share your story of landing on Redbreast. The contest runs through March 31st, 2020. Terms and conditions do apply. And one of those conditions is that the contest is only open to U.S. residents. You'll find all of the rules at the Redbreast website. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. It's presented by Lot40. Lots of emails and comments this week, including this email from David Lavin in Baltimore, Maryland. Knowing how difficult things are and are getting, I wanted to pass a story along. I visited Baltimore Spirits Company in Baltimore, and they were making hand sanitizer in order to give out to local health care workers from their heads off the distillate. Looks like they aren't the only ones because the local NBC affiliate here, WBAL, ran a story about another distiller doing so. We could all use some good news, and I think this is a good story of distillers working to help the community during this very uncertain time. Thanks, David. And once again, thanks to all of the distillers who are using their skills and their equipment 
to make hand sanitizers and disinfectants to help fight the coronavirus pandemic. We appreciate everything that you're doing. And Ed Perry had a related comment about hand sanitizer production on our Facebook page. All hope is not lost. Putting people's welfare above business is the best thing you can do in these dark days. Keep a stiff upper lip, and sunlight is at the end of the tunnel. Thanks, Ed. We also got this comment from Evan Chapman on our Facebook page the other day. How about a virtual tasting via Zoom or another app? with fellow listeners. Call it Pour and Share. Evan, we like your thinking. That's one of the ideas we're working on right now, and we'll keep you posted. And at Dram Stewart on Instagram had this comment on our special edition this week with the panel discussion from Dramfest earlier this month. Thanks for the extra cast, Mark. With that stellar panel, I only wish it would have been as long as Dave Broom had threatened at the beginning. Could have listened to you four all day. Slancha. Thanks for the kind words. It was a lot of fun that day, even though I did feel a bit out of place in that bunch. And David Lucas Kuhn asked this question about that panel. Do you have any other Charles McLean content in the archives you could post or direct us to? I could listen to him talk about Uskiba for hours. Well, we've had Charlie on the show several times over the years, and I would point you to the archives for episode 313 from April of 2011 and episode 611 from October of 2016 for a couple of my longer chats with him. Just a note here, the archives at whiskeycast.com are completely searchable, so if there is an interview that you'd like to listen to again, just use the search function on the website and see what comes up. In the meantime, if you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. We are all facing a lot of stress these days, and just as we don't always respond well under stress, yeast does not respond well when it's under stress during the fermentation process. But what exactly does stressing the yeast mean? Dr. Gary Spedding is a distillation and fermentation expert and consultant based in Lexington, Kentucky. During the recent Beam Institute conference at the University of Kentucky, I asked him to explain the concept. A lot of people would think stressing yeast means you're standing over the fermenter going, ferment, damn it, ferment. (laughs) What really is stressing the yeast when a distiller talks about it? All right, there's so many things involved in in stress of yeast. Um, You know, we we want the yeast to produce alcohol. Alcohol is a toxin. It's a toxin to us in high levels. It's a toxin to the yeast. Uh, The oxygen level, if the oxygen level is not fine, to build the strength of the yeast to begin to do its metabolism to produce the ethanol. Um, The the sugar concentration, there's an osmotic stress on the yeast if the sugars are too high. So I think the issue is, you know, it comes down to, do we have the right nutrient conditions? Have we trained that yeast to to be working in the right environment? And, and yeah, there's so many stresses on our yeast, just as there are on us as humans. If our nutrients are not correct, our conditions are not right, we're not warm enough, go out on a cold day, we're not happy, Um, the yeast is not happy, it's not going to perform as well as it should. And what happens then? It produces off flavors? How so? Yeah, it'll produce various off flavors. It won't uh, produce as much uh, uh, ethanol. Um, if the uh, fermentation is, if the yeast is under stress because there's other microbial contaminants there, say producing lactic acid, for every 1% of lactic acid that's produced uh, within the, uh, uh, the environment, it's 1% less alcohol is produced. So microbial stre- micro- microbes can cause stress on the yeast as well as a num- number of other factors. Yeah, that's, that's all good. In a nutshell, how does yeast work? 
How does yeast work? Just like uh, the rest of us, it's uh, fighting for its survival. It's out there. It's uh, it's about uh, reproduction. It wants to reproduce. It wants to grow. It wants to continue growing. We have to direct it to produce alcohol. It's just a it's a living organism living in an environment and in ecological conditions and responding to the environment just as you and I would. And essentially is eating the sugars in the mash and secreting alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's correct, yeah, and I think one of our speakers here at the conference today said that, you know, it, it uh, produces, uh, it detects sugars, it uh, produces ethanol as a uh, kind of a foodstuff it's throwing out, and it burps, I think he said burps carbon dioxide. So, um, so you know, it, it's doing what it does best if we give it the right conditions. And that carbon dioxide is a stressor too, right? It can be, yes, indeed. Uh, it certainly is a, definitely a stressor if it's building up in high levels. And, uh, you know, for a, for a beer, uh, for a brewer, they might want to uh, collect that carbon dioxide to give you carbonation. With most distilled spirits, we don't want that around. But, yes, the carbon dioxide can be a, 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 a stressor. Dr. Gary Spedding is also one of the founders of the new Society of Distilling Scientists and Technologists. We have a link for more details in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes goes all the way back to 2005. We'd love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2020. And comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay healthy.